Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning at our Savior's. I am Pastor Kiri. Uh, Deacon Glendy is here today. She is preaching as well. And uh, she will be leading Zoom coffee hours. So feel free after the worship service is over. You can find the Zoom link and then uh, join her and others for a conversation and, and a really neat way to connect. If you haven't tried it out, give it a try. It's a nice way to see other faces. feels ever so slightly normal, like we're gathering together after worship. This Sunday, we will celebrate Holy Communion again. So I invite you, if you have not already, to please get your bread or uh, bread and wine or grape juice ready for that part of the service. Well, coming up, Lent is coming very quickly now. In uh, Ash Wednesday, we will celebrate on February 17th. Our theme for Lent is called A Season of Hope. Ash, Lindy, Ash Wednesday services will be February 17th at 6.30. It will be live streamed here on Facebook just like this service. You can, if you choose, pick up a little bag of ashes to use as we do the uh, mark the sign of the cross when you are at home. If you're not able to come pick up ashes, we invite you to get uh, either a little dish of olive oil or water ready. We'll be making a sign in any of those different ways this year together. And then Wednesdays, the rest of the Wednesdays in Lent, for our season of hope, we are delighted that we will have different families from our saviors who will be sharing their stories of hope in this time. Uh, Wednesday, Lent, Lenten worship starting on February 24th will be at 6 p.m. and that will premiere on all of our channels at that time. Well, it's been a delight these uh, last few weeks to have a video from uh, people of our saviors to hear their connection point. And so this week, it's one of our staff members, Flory Vickstrom. Hi, I'm Lori Vickstrom. I have been coming and been a member for close to 33 years. I've worked here on staff for over 20 years. Uh, Pastor Curie has asked me to do this and she knows it's way out of my comfort zone, but I'll give it a try. Um, what's been hard during this pandemic for me and my family is not all of us being together as a big whole, you know, we have the fam smaller family get-togethers, uh, but not being able to continuously be with, do family vacations, uh, big family get-togethers, has been really hard as uh, we're pretty family-oriented and we pretty much live in each other's pockets. So doing that has been hard. We've had some tragedies in that uh, my son-in-law passed away uh, four months ago so doing that has been difficult not having all the family and friends around for all that and for the support for my daughter um, and here at work it's been really hard not um, seeing everybody uh, congregating on Sundays and the fellowship, just being together and enjoying each other. And we will get calls of people that keep asking when we're gonna open up and we would love to say tomorrow, but we just don't know. You know, we've done a few parking lot ones, a few in-person ones, and you know, we just wanna see everybody and hug them and you know, just say, you know, everything, everything's fine, come in the doors, but we can't. And it's, it's really hard for us when we have people call, especially the elderly that are sh really, truly shut-ins and don't have a lot of people that they can connect with. So we spend a lot of time on the phones talking to them and, you know, trying to say it, it will soon pass. What has brought me hope during this pandemic and probably joy is watching families reconnecting, uh, just spending time with each other at home, 
talking, sitting together on the couch, watching movies, sitting at the table playing games and puzzles, and just taking little backyard vacations uh, since they couldn't go anywhere. Uh, people reaching out and helping other people. Um, here at church, you know, we have all been blessed with all the generosity of people making sure our church stays successful and keeps growing. That families are just, just continue to keep connecting with friends and family through phone, through Skyping, through Zoom, uh, just phone calls. My faith has uh, sustained me for, for many, many years, not just through this pandemic. Um, I've had quite a few tragedies in my life with my family from losing two children to losing my son-in-law to uh, a dear friend that we just lost due to COVID and medical complications um, to parents and watching friends struggle with mental illness. If it wasn't for my faith, I wouldn't be able to get through all that. You know, God has got his hand on my shoulder and he's got it on all of your shoulders. You just gotta trust in God and we will get through this and we will have it all noisy in this building again. That's what we're praying for. That's what we're looking forward to. And we can't wait for it to happen. So hope to see you in live and in person very, very soon. Thank you, Lori. Lori is our building manager here at Our Saviors, and if you know her, she's a lot of fun. So our, our joke uh, last week after she made the video was, with this new fame of hers, we may need extra parking lot security for all those who might be coming now to get her autograph. So uh, thank you, Lori, for making that video, being part of this worship service. We continue with the first reading, which is from Psalm 147. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God on the harp. He covers the sky with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain and makes grass grow on the hills. He provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of the warrior. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Praise the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I'd like to invite the children to turn your attention to the screen or to slide a little closer for the children's message. We just read a great psalm that is about how great God is. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the grown-up sermon. But the next lesson is about a lady who was sick. She was very sick and she was in her own home. And guess what happened? Jesus came into her house and something changed. What I'd like you to listen for in the gospel this week is, what did Jesus do? And after Jesus did what Jesus did, 
What did the sick woman do? What happened? These are important questions because they tell us some things about us. One of the things that we learn in the story of this woman is that she was good at taking care of guests in her home. What are you good at? What do you think you can do really well? And when you get sick, are you stopped from doing those things? We kind of are, aren't we? So listen for what Jesus does for the sick lady and then think about what that means about what Jesus wants to do when you are sick. The Holy Gospel for this Sunday is found in the book of Mark, the first chapter. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Peter and Andrew. Simon Peter's mother-in-law was in bed with fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus, um, brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they know, knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and uh, his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as Pastor Kearney pointed out in her sermon last week, the gospel of Mark is filled with stories and it moves at a really fast pace. In the first part of this first chapter of Mark, Jesus calls his first four disciples, Peter, also called Simon, Andrew, James, and John, who immediately drop everything and follow him. In last Sunday's reading, which follows closely on the calling of the disciples, Jesus casts an evil spirit out of a man. This Sunday, we read the next thing that happens, all still in this very first chapter of Mark. These disciples who dropped everything to follow Jesus bring him home with them, or at least Peter and Andrew bring them to Peter's home. Peter's mother-in-law is sick with fever and is unable to serve her guests. Having a fever doesn't sound very dire, well, except in this age of coronavirus, which in some ways echoes the first century story. Before antibiotics, before vaccines, before modern medicines, having a fever could be dire indeed. If nothing could be done to stem the infection that caused the fever, Death often followed. Jesus goes in, doesn't speak powerful words of deliverance or healing as with the demon-possessed man, but simply takes Peter's mother-in-law by the hand and helps her get up. When Jesus did so, her fever went away, and then she did begin to wait on them. If you get hung up, as I often do, on the idea that Jesus made her whole and then she had to go and serve all the men, don't miss the point. Peter's mother-in-law was made whole. As a result of her being made whole, she could carry out what in the first century was one of the primary responsibilities of women, hosting and providing hospitality for guests. How many of us have had times when we couldn't do what seemed to be our responsibility, our job, our calling to use our gifts and so on? 
I would guess that most of us have had minutes or days or weeks or months or years when we felt estranged from who we were, when we felt like we weren't ourselves or were physically or emotionally unable to be who we are. I know I have. Sometimes it's anxiety or depression or low self-esteem that stop me. Sometimes it's physical illness or injury that stops me. Sometimes it's simply that I lose track of what matters in life. It gets lost in the sheer busyness of life. And as it was for Peter's mother-in-law, we end up in bed, literally or figuratively, wishing and wanting to be better, but unable to make ourselves so. In the simple act of taking her hand, Jesus made her whole. Two things happened in response to this simple action. First, her health was restored, the fever driven away, and she resumed her rightful place in the world. Second, the word got around town really fast, and after sunset, people brought to Jesus others who were sick or possessed of evil spirits. The whole town gathered outside Peter's home, and Jesus healed many of them, Mark tells us. Tiny side note for another sermon. Why many? Why not all? Well, back to this sermon. What a tremendous response to Jesus' simple action. And the next morning, people were again crowded around the whole house, hoping for Jesus' touch. And Jesus and the disciples headed off to the nearby villages to continue the healing and preaching ministry that he had begun in Capernaum. Our psalm today teaches us why we should trust Jesus' healing power by speaking of God's power and goodness. God heals the brokenhearted and binds up wounds. God knows the name of each of the stars and has unlimited understanding. God covers the sky with clouds, supplies the earth with rain, and makes grass grow on the hills. God provides food for cattle and young ravens when they call. The Lord delights in those who put their hope in this unfailing love. The God who does all this as an ongoing, on an ongoing and continuous basis can be trusted with our cares, our sense of distance from ourselves, our doubt, our fear. The God who knows and understands the natural world also knows and understands each of us to our very core. This God invites us into relationship from the dripping waters of baptism all through our lives. God is present. And in Jesus, this God comes to us as Jesus did to Peter's mother-in-law to help us become ourselves, to find our true selves, our true life in his life. This isn't just or even primarily, an encouragement towards self-fulfillment or self-actualization. This is God's invitation to become fully who you are meant to be and to do so in a way that sets you free to serve. God in Jesus reaches out to you and me and offers healing and wholeness, peace, forgiveness, mercy, love, and grace. Receiving these gifts, we, like Peter's mother-in-law, reach out in love and service to one another and to the world. Yesterday in New London, we buried a dear friend and colleague of mine going all the way back to 1985. Our paths ran parallel for many of those years. When I moved back to the Twin Cities from Chicago in 2001, Dell and I stayed in touch. In 2015, he made me promise that I would preach the sermon for his funeral whenever that came. And so it came. Del Wayne's strict instruction was, don't talk about me. Talk about the resurrection. Preach your best Easter sermon. So I started my sermon 
by apologizing to Del Wayne and talking about him a little bit. One of the things that I talked about was Del, Del's deep and abiding love of God, the genuine combination of a fierce intellect and a profound but simple certainty that the words that formed the basis for his faith were true. Jesus loves me. This I know. Del said that was the core of what he believed, and that song was sung at his funeral. His life reminded me of that reality, that we are made to love and serve God, and in loving and serving God, we love and serve the world that God has made. The first presiding bishop of the ELCA was Herb Chilstrom, and he was your bishop before he, of Minnesota uh, in the LCA before he became the first presiding bishop of the ELCA. Herb longed to come up with a sentence or a phrase that would describe who we were as Christians, and in 1990, he did. That phrase was, that we are a church so deeply and confidently rooted in the gospel of God's grace that we are free to give our lives in witness and in service. We, as with Peter's mother-in-law, are healed not only for our own sake. We find the fullness of life in service. It's something that I think we as a congregation are particularly good at, honestly. We are we engaged in layers and layers of ways of serving, from our giving to our volunteering, to our caring and love for one another, for those outside our congregation. As I've lived with you and walked with you and loved you so much for the last eight years, I want you to know that you have touched my life with your faith and your service. You have changed me. I expect that this is true of many of the friendships and relationships built in this congregation. I believe, I'm sure, that you will keep on being those kinds of people, that kind of church that doesn't exist for its own benefit and its own satisfaction. Having experienced God's love and grace, you will continue to reach out, as Herb said, in witness and in service, like the disciples, like Peter's mother-in-law, and like Christians everywhere, it's who God has made you to be. Amen.
guided by Christ made known to the nations. Let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. We pray for the church, for ministries of healing and wholeness, for hospital hospice and military chaplains, for those serving in prison ministry, for all who proclaim freedom and release in the name of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for the nations, for all who lead in cities and towns, states and countries, for community organizers, school officials and CEOs, for international health organizations that in times of trial, fear or hopelessness, they find freedom in service to those most in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all wearied by life's burdens, for those who are poor, for those lacking supportive relationships, for those crushed by debt, for those struggling with chronic pain or other sickness, for those exhausted from overwork or stress, and for all who cry out to you, especially Jackie Basney, Wani Johnson, Keith Hammerbeck, Dan Sloniker, Audrey Lundstrom, Becky Beck, Sherry Allensbach, Jim Berman Sr., Laura Gibney, Donna Nelson, Carol Gordon, Muriel and Burdell Bone, Parker, Roy Reichow, and those we name in silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In thanksgiving for the faithful departed who were called by name and now rest from their labors, that their lives serve as witnesses to the goodness of God, and for those grieving lost loved ones, we pray, for Patty Otto and her family at the death of her husband Brian, for Sue and Tim Casey at the death of Sue's brother-in-law, Don Scrivseth, for Bonnie Grant at the death of her mother, Eileen, for Karen and Steve Berg at the death of Karen's mother, Ruth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people spoken or silent for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We take a moment for our offering. As you hear us say week after week, we have a number of ways for you to give. You may uh, mail in a check. You can text the word, you can text a dollar amount to 1-855-708-0669. You can log on to our website and choose a giving option at our Savior's lc.org or you may sign up for automated giving by contacting the church office and talking to our bookkeeper Kim Freed. We give thanks for the gifts that you offer and let us give thanks to God for what God has given us. Let us pray. Gracious God, receive the gifts we bring, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. As we share this meal, unite us as one in you. Amen. Well, it is time for communion, so if you have got communion elements, it's time, uh, you can get them at hand as we share in this meal together. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We join together and pray the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Hear these words as you share communion in your, with your family or as you take communion at this time. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Receive the blessing. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. God of grace, you have refreshed us with this heavenly food. Send us forth strengthened in body and in spirit to proclaim the good news of Christ and to serve others in his name. Amen. Receive the blessing. May the God of glory dwell in you richly, shining brightly on your path. And may the blessing of Almighty God be with you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God.